All right, so again, what you guys are seeing here is a, um, is a, not, not a deep fake, but it's a shallow fake. This looks like it's a tree, but it is not, right? We can see a fake shadow underneath. We something that looks like a trunk and some, uh, some extension from the top of this tree. But this image is actually, is, is this image. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, start the slideshow and I'm going to try to take it pretty fast. I usually do. Um, and if there are questions, uh, feel free to just post them in the chat area. If anything looks weird, let me know. Um, so when I talk about research, I am talking about um, a high risk endeavor that is also high precision. So based on these four phases of research, the project setup, the project execution, reportage, and post-release vetting, um, there can be mistakes introduced at each of these junctures. And research is conducted, research itself is already terrifically difficult, but it is also occurring in a context of a lot of outside pressures like career survival, limited budgets, limited equipment, um, very complex work, competitive and competing colleagues, and so on. So some common risks and challenges to research integrity, very briefly, uh, may involve any of these basic challenges, right? So dishonesty is, is, is an important one, um, doing unskilled work, uh, lack of expertise, conflicts of interest, p-hacking, uh, sabotage, data corruption, data fabrication, plagiarism, credit, credit usurpation, um, premature release of, of research, research data, the misuse of funds, um, real world contingencies, poor data stewardship, a lack of a data management plan, going to publishing mills, uh, going with fake reviewers, and many others. Now, there are many complex steps in the research sequence, and here every member of, of a team matters. The leadership of the research team matters. Um, and review is not just something that happens during the work, but it happens after the work, and it goes back uh, so if we think about the future, uh, someone in the future can look back and review research and truth ultimately outs. So one research study examined the actions that distort scientific knowledge that do not include plagiarism, which means using others' ideas without crediting them, and this research found a minority of the respondents, about 2% admitted to have fabricated, falsified, or modified data or results at least once. And up to 34% admitted other questionable research practices. And 14% of research uh, of survey respondents said that their colleagues engaged in data falsification and up to 72% for other questionable research practices. In other words, uh, people didn't own up a lot to their own failures, but they were keeping an eye on their colleagues. So why do people fall into this challenge? Well, there are issues of personality and ego, self-deception, and what we talked about uh, extrinsic risks external to the person as well. And so I'm going to um, move on. Uh, this, uh, those slides, this whole slideshow is available under my name in SlideShare. But where this is relevant is that images are data. Images are data. And so here we have um, in this Venn diagram, uh, 
digital image editing capabilities, which are amazing in the current day and age, where you can edit an image down to the pixel level. We have machine learning from billions, tens of billions of images shared on the web and internet. And we have artificial intelligence integrated in uh, Adobe Photoshop 2021, which gives amazing capabilities for editing. And arrayed against that, we have legal and ethical constraints, um, the domain or subject area constraints, and some other, other barriers to uh, manipulating images. There's a section we won't get to probably in the time we have where I've put in some of the technical uh, tools arrayed against uh, image manipulation. So I will be asking you all about 14 questions. I'll give you 14 basic contexts based on the capabilities of Adobe Photoshop. Um, and then um, we can have a discussion at the end. So first, when we talk about positive control on digital image editing in research, there's the risk of self-deception where we misunderstand the image data or fall for spurious data. And then there's other deception where people misreport the image data or emphasize particular parts of a digital image that results in a lack of a, quote, pure data stream, unquote. So I'm going to skip the, the questions that I will be asking you, because you guys will have that um, nearer to the end. But I have a few quotes first about this issue. So uh, Jerry Sedgwick said, augmentation of digital image is almost always a necessity in order to obtain a reproduction that matches the appearance of the original. However, that augmentation can mislead if it is done incorrectly and not within reasonable limits. So the question is, what are reasonable limits? And in, uh, he also said, when procedures are in place for correct acquisition of images, the extent of post-processing is minimized or eliminated. So this is the idea that if you capture the images right the first time, you don't have to do any tweaking uh, on the other side of it, potentially. And then a different author, Emma Frau, wrote, concerned not so much with intentional fraud, but rather with routine and innocent yet inappropriate alteration of digital images. Uh, several high profile science journals have recently introduced guidelines for authors regarding image manipulation and are implementing in-house forensic procedures for screening submitted images. And we're gonna get a statistic. In journals that check figures after acceptance, 20 to 25% of the papers contained at least one figure that did not comply with the journal's instructions to authors. The scientific press continues to report a small but steady stream of cases of fraudulent image manipulation. So just very briefly, since I'll be asking you guys the 14 questions and uh, we'd be interested in your feedback, what are some healthy practices? Well, one, if you're capturing images is to have a pristine master set because oftentimes the scans and the uh, camera images are the most high resolution and this pristine master set should not be, um, be edited. Um, it should be preserved uh, in good form. There should be proper image capture at the beginning. Um, because there is only so much you can do if you have a poorly captured initial image. I had a little side note that just came out. Photoshop came out with super res 
in March 2021, which relies on artificial intelligence to interpolate additional pixels. But that is AI making assumptions of where the image was taken and what sorts of pixels would add value, right? Okay, and then it helps to have a lineage to know where the image came from, to have a provenance. Um, so there should be a clear chain of custody. Uh, there should be very strong foundations at how to arrive at the visual. So if someone is creating a born digital diagram, the conventions of the diagram should be followed. So you're not um, miscommunicating information, for example. Um, so I, on my campus, I'm an instructional designer, but I also help students who are graduating with their electronic theses, uh, dissertations, and reports. And I also uh, review publications for a lot of publishers. And I will say that I see a lot of diagrams that don't even follow basic conventions and that have misspellings and other unprofessionalisms. So um, obviously, if uh, every part of a visual should be properly labeled, um, and there should be, if size is relevant, then sizing measures and dimensions should be accurately indicated if colors especially are relevant, as they are in most cases, they should be properly balanced against uh, too much warmth or too much cool, right? So yellow or blue. Legends that are used in visuals should be accurate. The visual should be controlled for all possible intended and unintended uses of the visuals. Um, and digital and informational contents obviously should be accessible. If there is uncertainty in the visual, that should be represented accurately. And it helps to know who the audience is that will be consuming the digital images, the interpretive lens potentially that they will be using. Another very fair assumption, I think, is that uh, visuals may well be separated from the original slideshow or the original article. And so it should be able to stand on its own. So the question of this is, if there's a fidelity to artificiality continuum, where does fraud occur in your particular discipline? When is it considered dishonest uh, when you edit an image a particular way to where it tips from a, a, an accurate representation of your whatever your image is, is, is uh, describing and it becomes artificial? So here's the first question of 14. So is it considered inappropriate to interpolate pixels if you have a low resolution image? And so this is one, one question to consider. Um, this is especially regarding raster images that have uh, images in bits. And um, so then, is it appropriate to have the AI sharpen the edges? Um, is it appropriate to, uh, to remove all color and go with black and white or a gray scale? Because sometimes that can heighten focus on the lines and edges, right? So something to think about. The second question, um, if you have a series of photos and you have too much warmth or too much cool, is it appropriate to change the white color balance and put all the other colors in relation to white at a certain uh, level with the white, right? 
Then there is artificial lighting. In post-production, it's possible to change various lighting effects of an image. So particular focal regions may be lit more to draw the human eye. You can um, change the midtones for uh, particular textural details by changing up the uh, curve on the histogram or the spread on the histogram. So is that appropriate? What about zooming and cropping, rotating, flipping and skewing? So sometimes when you're doing field work or taking photos in the wild, uh, things might get skewed. Perhaps uh, the visual looks better if you readjusted it. Um, can you go ahead and just crop out what you are not interested in? Can you rotate an image? Let's say you held the camera a few degrees off true, then is it appropriate to go ahead and fix your image so it's not skewed or tilted? Can you, um, can you remove visual information or put in filler pixels? Right, and this is the question that started my curiosity about this. Uh, I was doing a presentation on Adobe Photoshop uh, for students, and one of the students wanted to take a slide, and he said, there's some mistakes in this. I wanna remove the errors and put in some filler. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, let's talk about that. You know, is that appropriate in your field? Because you don't want to, um, Actually, I don't know if he was a student or a staff, but I didn't want to send someone out um, getting into all kinds of trouble, right? So he was like, how do you do it? And of course, there's like five or six different ways to do that, right? You could do cloning, you could do patching, you could do spot healing. Um, but I actually kind of ducked the question and didn't tell him because, and since he was a newbie, <laughs> I don't know if he, I don't know. Anyway. Um, he could have gone to YouTube to figure it out. He didn't need me to do it, but I didn't want to do it either. So oh, let's see if I can, um, whoop, um, is that right? Okay, good. Sorry, my, my thing stopped working. Okay, so can you move an object or resize an object in a frame? Or is that inappropriate? Does that change the factuality of the visual? If you use diagnostic color filters for analysis, um, how do you represent these? Do you, uh, when you report on research, do you go back to the original or do you use the ones with different tinting uh, with some explanation perhaps? Can you mask? Masking refers to selectively hiding and selectively revealing. This is in reference to the different layers that you can uh, use in Photoshop and Illustrator. So the question is, you know, can you hide certain things? Can you blur certain things? When is masking appropriate or is it never appropriate? What about compositing, combining, or fusing? So compositing means you take a number of different layers and you take visuals from different sources and you make a visual that is uh, potentially novel, right? Maybe it's for the depiction of fictional or imagined scenarios. Uh, and then in, in that case, would that be appropriate? What about uh, explanatory depth? If you are dealing with complex imagery, how much explanation should you go to in the lead up text, in the lead away text, beyond just the visual, right? So in the context that the visual is used. And then if you have explanatory language, is it fair to avoid contravening data? So if you have a hypothesis and you found some support for it in one area, 
less so in others? Is it fair to withhold information and not share that when publishing? Uh, how do you frame it? How do you couch it? Or should you just put the contravening data just in the footnotes with the assumption that maybe people don't read the footnotes? What about batch processing with macros? So if you have a set of images and you can go through, set up a, a little macro to handle all the images in the folder, do you go ahead and run the batch even if some of the images do not fit the assumed criteria? Right, because if you do that, that might introduce a skew in the visual. What about for aesthetics uh, or branding and or branding? Perhaps the funding agency wants a particular presentational aesthetics or branding or messaging. Happens all the time uh, for the grants that I am part of, a little tiny part of. So is it fair to change up the visuals in a research work to align with particular aesthetics, particular values, particular political lines? And then the last question, what about machine learning and AI? So Adobe Photoshop 2021 enables machine learning and AI features like skin smoothing, like changing up facial expressions of people in a photo. You can um, put different moods on them. You can age them. You can make them younger looking. Um, you can take art styles, just visual color palettes from one visual and apply it to another. So when is it appropriate to use neural filtering and other features to look better to others? Is it appropriate to use them to change up the facial expressions of a professional adversary to make them look worse? Uh, if so, why and when? <laughs> and what are some other ways to engage this issue? Um, and it looks like actually I might have a little time to cover some of these. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about some ways to get found out before we take on questions if there are any. So um, I did a little bit of fast research out of my own curiosity. Um, so various different disciplines have their own methods for authenticating imagery from metadata, like geotags, contextual information captured by the camera, from image forensics, from image comparisons, and other singular and mixed approaches. So failing authentication is one way to be found out, and it's one way to rouse the ferrets. You can get found out by people. So you can tell on yourself. You can tell on yourself with what you assert privately and publicly. So mistruths, contradictions, and slippage can be revelatory. You can tell on yourself with the digital digitized imagery that you shared under your name. By being in the chain of custody and vouching for the provenance of the information, you are affirming the apparent validity of the contents. Your colleagues can tell on you. Colleagues are competitive and they're on the lookout for fumbles. That sounds terrible since everyone at this conference is so polite. <laughs> I probably should not have put that in there. So research and publishing are gauntlets. People check each other out and check out each other's works. Your imagery can tell on you. Imagery is multidimensional and complex. It's revelatory in ways that most are not aware. There are a number of image forensics tools for automated identification of edited digital images, especially in two dimensions, the x-axis, the y-axis. Um, but there are now some for 3D, the x, y, and z axes. There are physics-based methods based on how light falls, on universal ways that light falls. Um, and people, when they edit, tend to be a bit sloppy. There are programs that can identify cameras that were used to take the images based on the images alone. There are technologies that can identify the tampered regions of a digital image. 
There are different wavelet analyses approaches that are also used to identify regions of interest for anomalies. There are programs that detect anomalies in terms of the color gamut. We, there are ways to separate out colors in red, green, blue, RGB, and others that enable identification of anomalous regions with that technique. There are validation approaches like image hashing. There's watermarking. Um, there are digital signatures. Some blockchain technologies are also used to define originals and anything else is a fake. Um, and then there are sets of visuals um, on the open and public web and internet that machines uh, are trained on to learn to identify um, anomalies and to maintain a history against which new information may be compared. There are digital image manipulation detection web services coming online. Um, for uh, according to various academic research articles. So retouches, doctoring, and other digital image manipulations can be eminently seeable and empirically established, even if there's nobody who's after you or really cares, right? So they can just, this can just run passively and it can, you know, find different interesting things, right? Um, and if you have high assertions, you need high evidence, and that stuff will obviously be much more scrutinized. Uh, the Office of Research Integrity has different image forensics tools, right? And those, the above is a bit uh, out of date. Built into Adobe Photoshop are other tools now that can identify image manipulation, and I didn't go deeply into that. Um, haven't researched that, only heard about it at uh, the Adobe conference last year in October. There are advances in 3D space, right, to test 3D point clouds if they're, and actually, and this, well, okay, so I'll just leave it there. So, so basically, um, there's a lot arrayed against the artificial, so it's pretty beneficial to know what the rules are, what the policy regimes are, and to know what's happening when you're editing digital images. So there are lots of ways that a person can be found out and lots of different negative outcomes. So um, it helps to think long-term and not short-term. It helps not to get yourself into some sort of bind where you don't have to make excuses and uh, ways to shore yourself up if you are finding yourself slipping. So my question in this presentation is this, what does image fidelity in your area of research look like and why? How do you achieve the proper level of image fidelity for professional practice? Where are the risks of potentially lapsing into or choosing artificiality? And what are the best practices to avoid image manipulation? So um, this is my contact information. Um, and then I'll go ahead and stop. Well, let's see. <laughs> I don't want to like accidentally do something not, not great. So let me just um, hit, since we're at the end of the slideshow, um, and I would be happy to take any questions um, if there are any. Um, oh, hopefully, uh, I, I hope I hope you guys were able to hear all that. Hello. Oh my God. <laughs> Oh, there is somebody around. Very oh, interesting. Give, gives, a lot, <laughs> gives a lot to think about. Okay, are there any comments or questions? Oh, th thank you guys. That's super sweet. Um, um, yeah. Oh, so the link I will give you guys, if anybody wants, I will put this into chat. This is in um, SlideShare and 
Oh, that's a great question. So Nathaniel said, why not include the original image as well as the edited image and a reason? Oh, okay, okay, wait. So, um, so yeah, so I think that might be a good solution to have the original image and then the edited one as a comparative. I have seen that before in some contexts, but remember space is very, um, it's, uh, space is rare. And um, even the um, at the ends of sentences, instead of having two spaces, you only put in one, right? Uh, in most publications that are print because um, you're trying to save every little bit of space. So, but having a comparative would be interesting. Um, uh, and I've seen some side by sides, so that's a that's a good one. What about some others? I hope this doesn't put people off engaging in research because there's a lot um, there's a lot that people have to contribute. I just think um, it's one of those things where it's probably a good idea to know what what's go, what's up um, before you uh, take some of those risks. Um, it's it's like in any space you go into, you want to know uh, what it's about. Um, yeah, so did you guys, does any, can anybody tell me if I were to go back to the image I shared here, right? This, um, this uh, shallow fake, not a deep fake. Does anybody know how, how I got to here? from this visual, whoops, from this visual? How does one get to, to this? No clue. <laughs> it's actually from, um, and so Brett says, I've absolutely no, okay, so let me, um, if I, it's, um, it's a depth map. So um, so since there's a little extra time, I'm going to go ahead and open up. Can you guys see my Photoshop? Oh, good. OK, good, good. Um, can't tell with that endless recurs recursion of the screen. <laughs> um, it's, probably, it's probably something that I should do. But OK, so weirdly, so I'm going to Go ahead and close this out. I'm going to go ahead and open. I'm going to go to my check 2020, my imagery one. I'll uh, grab, um, this is JPEG, this is PNG. I'll just take the smaller one. I'll take the JPEG. So this is a two-dimensional image. This was created using alcohol ink on a synthetic paper. You go to the 3D uh, filter area and you are going to use, you're going to make a depth map. So we're going to make a depth map out of this green and white and black visual. Um, so as a depth map, it's going to be not a lot of uh, contrast per se, because it's only one uh, hue. Right, it's one one chroma essentially. It's just the green, um, and you get something that looks like this, right? So we can zoom straight in, and this is a depth map. And then there were some other things that I applied to to this. This you have you can't leave it as as a it would be a, a dot tiff probably or a PSD, just saving it straight out. But if you saved it out as a ping file and then you came to the filtering and you uh, sharpened some of the edges and you pulled the edges, you could get that visual that I showed you. Um, 
In terms of the AI that is in, um, well, there's AI built into various parts of, of Photoshop, but uh, if we had this had the neural filters turned on, this is where the AI, uh, a lot of the AI uh, capabilities are here. So based on the type of image you have, certain things will gray out, but, um, but there's a lot that you can do with an image. And that's not only um, the distortive stuff, but you can always come in here and you can change um, the hue, the saturation, um, the color balance. Uh, you can crop. Oh, part, part of it also is I'm in my 3D um, 3D range, which takes out some other some other of our options. Um, but again, like I said, it's this type of, of image that we have. If I changed it, saved it out of JPEG, made it RGB, and made it a ping, you could actually do much more editing. But um, anyway, so let me go ahead and um, and minimize this. Um, and anytime you're in in 3D, of course, you can always you know, you can always spin and twist and turn. You have a light source. You guys can kind of see where the light source is, is from. You can move the light source. Um, so there's things you can do just with artificiality um, and, and so on. So, okay, I'm going to go ahead and minimize this. Um, and let's see. So Nathaniel said, yep, very cool and somewhat scary to think about how good the fakes will become in the future. Yeah, especially with a lot of video. And it's interesting how maybe maybe we're not as skeptical uh, as we should be. Um, and maybe we like the artificial more than we um, like the unfiltered maybe we do, we can't handle unfiltered so yeah so i'm not sure but <laughs> but um you know uh, some something to think about um i i've known i've I, I mean just reading the news you have some very good researchers who based on an assertion um or two or three their careers are over it it doesn't take a lot so being super scrupulous is not a bad idea, just uh, out of a sense of caution. So, okay. Um, any other comments? Any other questions? Actually, I don't think we had any questions. Nope. Um, Yeah, um, the other thing I should say is that um, regarding Photoshop, if you real and and Illustrator and anything else, um, if you are a better editor than I am, um, you could do even more. <laughs> so um, and so what I just covered is pretty basic and I did it one sort of general feature at a time. But um, if you could do stuff in a sequence, um, there's ways that you could even fool yourself if you went through us through different sequences, got different outputs, um, and then and you don't keep a memory if you don't keep your layers, um, and so you can't go back step by step to see what you've done. Um, it can be uh, a bit of a challenge. So. Um, Yep. So if there is nothing else to Neil, should we go ahead and just call this good? And um, everybody um, have a wonderful day. What do you think? Or we could wait. I, I'm fine either way. <laughs> it's totally up to you. Uh, we have a couple minutes left, so I mean, we can end the session um, or you can stick around for a couple minutes. I'll go ahead and just let everyone know here that the last sessions do start at 3 p.m the birds of a feather. So I just put that in the chat. Um, so it'll be about a 15 minute break. So, so yeah, up to you. Cool. Okay. 
Okay. Well, thank you. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Miriam and Thomas and Nathaniel. Thank you, Tanil, for hosting this session. Um, and it's been uh, super fun. Uh, so um, anyway, everybody, please be well. And I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and call it good. Bye, everybody.